Fast is Breaking Bird Doll Podcast. I'm your host, Scotty D, and please like, subscribe, and all that good stuff. Corporal Brian um, is still active in uh, the military, so he's unable to join us today. However, um, we've put together another great podcast for you guys. We, uh, I'm joined again by former U.S. Army Captain Connor Crehan from Barstool Sports No Quitters Podcast. And uh, we also have a special guest joining us today. Former U.S. Army Sergeant Brendan, Brendan O'Byrne from the Oscar-nominated documentary Restrepo. In the, document, in the documentary, Brendan and his fellow soldiers spent a lot of time at the at COP Restrepo, which stands for Combat Outpost. Um, COP Restrepo is very similar. Well, it's, I don't know how similar it is, but it, it is similar to OP Mess in Serial which is uh, where Bergdahl walked away from. And today we're going to be reviewing episode 3 and 4 from Serial, and uh, I'm excited to get both of your perspectives on this. Um, before we start, I'd like to take a minute just to shout out uh, a different Brendan, Brendan Clancy from KFC Radio. Um, our podcast probably would not have been going as smooth and and everything's going our way and it's really uh, I, I thank Brendan for that because you linked me and Connor up together and um, you know we've, we've really taken it since then and uh, we're doing well so. Brendan do you want to close yeah there you go I, I can uh, I can edit all this stuff later it's no big deal <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, how you guys doing? Um, I'm doing well. Um, coming off a uh, late night uh, recording that other podcast, but otherwise, uh, I'm doing well. Having a good Thursday. Looking forward to the weekend. Awesome, Brendan. How are you doing? I'm good, man. I'm good. Just hanging out. Would you uh, Would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, I mean, uh, when I was I served in the military. Um, I joined in 2002 when I was uh, 18 years old. I uh, did a few years, a couple years in the National Guard, and then I went from the National Guard. I was a tank mechanic in the National Guard, if you, of all things. And then uh, I went from the National Guard over to the regular infantry in 2004, and I served in the 173rd Airborne Brigade for a while. And uh, while I was there, I served in uh, the Korangal Valley with them from May of 2007 to August 2008. And um, now I'm going to school up in uh, University of New Hampshire. And, and, um, and I live in Dover, New Hampshire now. That's oh, awesome. interesting. I was, uh, I was actually just up there recently this football season. Uh, a very good friend of mine is the offensive coordinator for the football team. So I come oh, up right on. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, for those who don't know, Brendan, why don't you tell people where the 173rd is based out of, and if you could, you know, tell us what that was like to live there. Uh, yeah, the 173rd is based out of Vicenza, Italy. Um, it's, I mean, it's a pretty, it's a pretty interesting place to live, but you know, it's it's not as cool as you think sometimes. You know, when we got back from, I mean, Italy is beautiful. There's nothing wrong with Italy, but um, the the town itself, Vicenza, Italy, there was constantly protest, um, almost weekly, anti-American protest, anti anti-government protest uh, against our base inside of uh, Vicenza, Italy. And uh, I remember getting back from uh, Afghanistan, and and every every morning, outside our gates, we would have uh, a group of protesters spitting on us or or calling us baby killers or stuff as we were running off the off the base. We had to stop running off base after a while. Because they would they would just be such a problem, so it was, it was a great place to live. But it was also you know it came with its own set of issues too. Wow, that's interesting. Actually, I didn't know that part. I just assumed, uh, you know, the fact that you lived in Italy and living in Europe when you're not deployed or training up for a deployment, and you have the opportunity to travel a little bit. Um, you know, it, compared to some of the other places in the army, like Fort uh, Fort Polk or Fort Sill. You know, Vincenza, Italy is a much more desirable location, so you certainly lucked out in that regard. Oh, without a doubt, yeah. I, I mean, I, you know, I'm knocking it a little bit for its people, but the the uh, the, t the the base which itself was awesome. I mean, the unit was great. Um, we got to go up to Germany for training. 
it, it was, you know, I, I mean, I jumped into Aviano. I was in Airborne, so I jumped into Aviano, and, you know, we're out in Aviano watching, like, you can see all the bomb craters from World War II and World War I. It, it was very cool, man. So, That's I mean, I, 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 I can talk about, as bad as I want about it, but it was amazing, you know? <laughs> That's yeah, awesome. definitely. So, um, Brendan, you you have a very interesting story. Uh, we first see you at the very beginning of the documentary. Um, we're just going to talk about the documentary for a minute or two, and then we'll get into serial. But um, we see you on the plane with Doc Restrepo, who the documentary is named after. And um, like you had told me, he's a funny bastard. Yeah. He, he he had me laughing on that. He's like, "Get out of here! I'm the narrator." And that that's yeah. funny shit. Wow. You know, when when he passed away, uh, we all have our our different. Uh, there's called a blue book. Uh, before you go on a deployment, you get like you have to fill out certain things, like um, you know, who who's gonna if you get killed, who's gonna bring your remains home? Who's you know what what kind of ceremony is it gonna be? What kind of religious ceremony do you want for your service and everything like that? And one of the things that you have to do is you have to pick a song that to be played at your your memorial, you know. So we're we're all you know Doc Restrepo was an amazing cat, and um, so we're all really heartbroken. We're everyone's crying, saluting his his thing at, at, on his on his service, and then uh, at the end of the the service they play the song that he picks, and it was I, "Stay Alive" in Spanish. <laughs> you know, so that's the kind of cat that w that Restrepo was. You know, even even in death, he was making us laugh. Like you, you seriously, you pick staying alive in in Spanish, you dick. You know, <laughs> that, that is funny. Um, another funny part I just want to mention real quick was when um, I think it's Steiner and a couple of the boys just start dancing to a song like "Feel Your Body." <laughs> yeah. Yeah, those those are my guys, you know. Steiner yeah. was my one of my soldiers, and you know those guys were always knuckleheads. You know, you have to smile in combat, you know. It's a, it can be a really bad place, but if you if you don't want it to be, it can be a really nice place also. <laughs> as Absolutely. weird as that sounds. Absolutely, um, I I hear you. Yeah, it's um, all about it's all about perspective, right, Brandon? It's that's all it is, man. It's a, that's whole that's all life is, you know, perspective. Yeah, uh, absolutely, absolutely. Because I I always tell people. You know, sometimes people like feel sorry for me that I I deployed and I was gone from family and friends and missed out on a lot. But on the flip side of that, I always like to tell people I was very fortunate because it gave me an opportunity to gain a perspective that I otherwise would not have gained, and has really made life that much more enjoyable for me. Because, like you said, it is a great way to just attack life if you can just keep that perspective and and keep a positive attitude. And it, it was a it was it was an interesting way to learn it, obviously, but ultimately it worked out for the best. But you think about this. I mean, how, could you have learned the lessons that you learned inside combat about life, about you know, just the the amazing things that you learn inside combat about caring for each other, about all those things? You could have never learned it in any other way. No, I mean, not at all. It's 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 like this learning process that you can't get in any other way in any kind of fashion inside of our society. And it's it's a it's pretty incredible to, to know those lessons, you know. Absolutely. Um, that no, it's 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 great. You 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 can. It's funny. You can talk to your buddies. I, I remember like before I deployed. Um, you talk to your buddies and you want to get a perspective, or you know, you talk to your buddies, kind of want to know what's going to happen. You can ask them a million questions. You can read a million stories. You can read a million books. But then, in, unless you go and experience it for yourself, that's when you really fully understand and appreciate it. Uh, and that's the only way that you can do it. So yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, Ab absolutely, guys. Um, like I, I've never been to combat. I wasn't in the military or anything. But um, when I was 20 years old, I got diagnosed with cancer. I had three tumors in my lungs, two in my stomach, and you know the chemotherapy beat me down. But I feel like I have a little bit of a perspective like that because it completely changed my life um, for the better. And it made uh, made my perspective, you know, on life a lot different. So yeah. I, uh, it gives you the respect for life, right? I mean, eh, unless you really face that that life or death experience, you you don't you don't fully respect life. I mean, it's it's the truth of it. I mean, it's a 
it's part of the reason why society is so messed up because you know you, they're in this insular bubble that never really has to deal with that that coming to terms with death. You know, mm -hmm. and if when you have to come to terms with death, you learn something about life that you you can't learn in any other way. You, you know, coming to terms with death inside combat or coming to terms with death when you're dealing with cancer. That is the most valuable lesson you can ever learn in life, I think, is, is to learn how to deal with death and look you straight in the face. Absolutely. And tell it to go fuck itself. Exactly <laughs> right. But, um, yeah, I thank you guys for your service. It's, um, I'll always say that, but um, I just wanted to mention that stuff. Uh, now, you uh, also, when you were over there, um, they said that something close to 70% of the ordnance and bombs that were dropped at the time during that war, during the war in Afghanistan happened where you were in the Korngal Valley. Um, CNN said that President Bush saw it and said it was the deadliest place in the world. So I mean, I can I can only imagine how that is because you know I had to deal with it my shit for a couple months and stuff like that and reoccurring all the um, you know health issues. But you guys, you know, I never had someone actively, a real person, out trying to kill me. So. Yeah. Well, you know, I think, I think after, you know, the, the uh, there was, I guess it was like one-fifth of all the combat that was happening inside of Afghanistan, out of the 70,000 troops were in, in Afghanistan were happening about, with roughly about 80, 80 people inside of my, uh, my company. And uh, that's, a, that's a good amount of combat, you know. But... What the, the great thing about the human mind and the human body is that we're really good at adapting to shit, you know? So uh, after our first, you know, those first three months of really getting hammered every day, getting shot at maybe two or three times, sometimes up to five times a day, you know, after you learn how to deal with that and put that in its own little bubble and its own little box, you can really, you can really deal with it afterwards, you know? It, it starts to become normal, uh, which is the hard part about coming home. Is yeah, it, I was I was just saying it becomes part of the routine. Yeah, and then and then putting it back down is is the hardest thing. Is it's 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 getting a, it's now breaking that habit to come back home. You know, mm -hmm. it's a what do I do when I'm not in, getting shot at? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, it's it. crazy. What do I do? What do I do when I don't have to carry a rifle everywhere? Right. What, what do I do with my hands? You know, what, I don't, I don't know what to do with my hands. <laughs> I mean, seriously, I, it, it was such a, it's a funny thing. But you know, when I was in, it, I would always had my hands on my rifle. Yeah. You know, like, mm -hmm. what do you do with your hands afterwards? You know, it's, it's a funny thing, but you don't even think about it. Absolutely. Yeah, crazy. Um, and like you guys said, posit a positive attitude goes a long way. It really does. If you can stay mentally tough and mentally positive you can get through almost anything in life. And, and, um, no, no, you can, no, let, let, you can get through any, not almost, you can get through anything in life with a positive attitude, even death. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, there's nothing that can break the, the spirit of the human. I mean, you, you just can't break it. If you don't want it to be broken, you don't have to have it broken. You know, that's one thing I did learn in combat. Even in the, it, I saw guys laid out on stretchers with their fucking legs gone. And these guys are more worried about the people at home or the people that were in the in the vehicle with them when the IED hit than they are about themselves. That is the spirit that that you know surpasses everything. It doesn't. There's no stopping that, you know. So you can get through anything in life, I think. Yeah, Brandon. Right. Um, I, I I always tell people, um, you know, my not my greatest fear when I deployed was that I was not going to bring everybody home as a platoon leader. Were you, were you, I don't remember, I don't recall, were you an NCO? Uh, yeah, I was, yeah, I was a sergeant, E5. Yeah, so I mean, you, you had the same deal. It's like you got other lives that you're responsible for, and it's unbelievable, like you said, that everyone genuinely is caring for everyone but themselves, it seems like. Um, but I think that just speaks to the, the warrior ethos and the heart of every good soldier. Um, you know, which I think is a little bit lacking in the uh, topic of this podcast, in the or the subject of this podcast, the guy we're talking about, uh, one of the things he was missing. But, yeah, I think that's really what makes soldiers in the Army and, uh, you know, Marines and, and, and sailors and all our service members more special than any other military in the world. 
you know, to bring it full circle, I th you know, it, when we're talking about Bergdahl, you know, when when you want to talk about Bergdahl, you, you know, we all we all hear about the desertion, we all hear about the the stupid decisions that he made, but what I don't hear a lot of people talking about is that he abandoned his friends. Like, if you're you're in a combat outpost, right? Now this is you only have that team. That, mm -hmm. I mean, that's the only thing that you have is the people, the left and right of you, to protect your get, to get your back. So for him to walk off base, he's basically saying he's giving the middle finger to everyone on that base because he doesn't have their back. I mean, that's the big thing that I've I've, I've never never hear anyone talk about. Like, this is a guy that deserted his friends, the the, the people that to, to rely on him and that he relies on. Yeah. Yeah, his brothers exactly. And, and I talked about point. that. A little bit in the last um, podcast trying to explain and opine to people, you know, I, I spent time on some big fobs, but then also I spent more than half my time out on a tiny cop, and there's only, you know, 100 people, give or take, and those are the only people you're interacting with every day, whereas at a big fob, you might, you know, see the people at the gym that are there at the same time, or see different people in the defect, uh, the dining facility, what have you. But out on a cop, yeah, it's really like you're a close-knit family. And for him to just say "screw you" to everyone is something that, as I've stated, does not sit well with me, and I don't think it sits well with just about anybody who's served in combat. That's right. So, um, getting into serial, uh, Sergeant Bergdahl, I, I hate saying that, <laughs> was was in Pakistan at the time. Um, he said he was blindfolded after uh, he was captured and moved to different locations for the majority of like three months. Uh, at the time, he, he was um, at this point in the podcast, he was already traded at the Khani Network, and um, that's that's a like a very powerful group. Like I stated a little bit in the last podcast, um, they're a Pashtun family that's aligned with the Taliban, and. Um, Sarah, Sarah uh, compares the Haqqani Network to the Sopranos, which I thought was interesting because they aren't really a large military group. Isn't it like that they have like smaller factions to create that network? That's how I understand the Haqqani Network, at least. I don't know if that's correct, but yeah, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not very well versed in in the Hakani uh, network. I wish I, w I should. I should be a little bit more, but uh, I, I'm not. I don't know too much about it. All good. Um, yeah. I just, you know, the, the the funny thing with me is it, is that it everyone just sort of summed up into one ball. If you were shooting at me, you were shooting at me. If you weren't, you weren't. <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> yeah, I really don't give a shit. You know, who you're from, <laughs> what you associate yourself with. You're shooting at me. I. I don't. I don't want to be friends with you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> You're not gonna take him out to dinner? No, probably not. <laughs> not at least on the first firefight. Maybe on the second one. <laughs> yeah. Once we get to know each other. <laughs> so there, um, there were a lot of propaganda videos of uh, Bergdahl on the internet. Um, I'm sure they're all over YouTube. Bo said they made at least a dozen though that were never showed. Um, he said the reason was that the Hakani Network was afraid that it would blow up their location, basically. It would, get, it would give it away. So they decided, um, I'm not sure which episode, but they said they would, re they would um, record, a, record a video of him, then shave his beard, shave his head and stuff like that, change his clothes, and then record another one to make it look like it, it happened at a different time. Uh, yeah, I never knew that. Yeah, that that was uh, in I believe that was in like the second uh, episode or something. But um, as a U.S. as a U.S. Army private at the time, Bo had um, had A level A level SEER training, which stands for survival, evasion, resistance, and escape. Um, I'm sure you guys have both gone through that too. Uh, would you guys like to break that down a little bit, like what goes into that training? Uh, Brandon, go ahead, just because I, I think, you know, we've had uh, two different paths uh, into the Army, so you, you go ahead. I mean, the SEER, the, there's a SEER school, and then there's a, just basically a SEER, SEER training. 
Mm -hmm. And, I mean, we all get the SEER stuff going through uh, basic training, you know, what you say, what you don't say in, in, into your captors, and uh, how you basically present yourself in front of the camera. Uh, basically, what you give is your, your rank, your name, which unit you were with, and that's about it. I mean, you really don't, you don't talk about much else. Uh, everything else, it gets beaten out of you or, or tortured out of you, I guess. I don't know. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's basically what you do or don't say, how you act. Okay, I, I was thinking originally that um, that would be like um, like the gas mask and stuff like that that they kind of put you through to get you used to it. Is that is that different? It's uh, no, it's, I mean gas gas stuff is is uh, is is much different. It's it's okay. it's basically all Sears training is is basically about how, hey, how do you how do you present yourself in front of the if if you get captured? First of all, don't get captured. This is how you not not to get captured. And if you do get captured, this is how you present yourself in front of the camera when they put the camera on or or when they're just beating you up, you know. Uh, and you're supposed to hold out. You're supposed to do everything you can to um, to not give any information. But we saw how the the Navy did just recently on on that with that Iran. So yeah, uh, maybe we should revisit this. Um, the, the 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 military needs to revisit this because I guess this year isn't given going very well. That was yeah. unbelievable, too. Brendan, do you go through that training? Is that during basic or is that during AIT? Uh, no, so AIT is um. Advanced individual training, depending on which branch of the army that you're going to, for those that are not familiar. But yeah, uh, and that comes after basic training. But uh, I'm just curious if that happens during basic or AIT. I think it happens during basic. I, you know, it, it all sort of blends together for me. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, I, I think mostly, most of it happens in basic training. I'm sure there's some stuff that happens also in advanced uh, inf infantry or advanced individual training. Uh, but I, I think I remember it more happening inside of uh, um, uh, basic training. So while Bo was captured, um, over time he managed to gather tools throughout his captivity, um, which enabled him to make his, uh, I guess it's his second escape because he made that first escape during the first week, which was just stupid to me. I mean, he he said he just didn't hear anybody, and he made a run for it, and then he got tackled by 50 people. What it felt like? I mean, you got to be smarter than that. You and he's got to make it like this. The second escape, which we're going to talk about right now, that should have been his first escape, because like you got to really pick your spots. I would feel, you know, like I I just think it was stupid for him to have tried to just run away while he was either handcuffed or whatever like it just it just didn't make sense to me. Well, I think it, I think it's easy it's easy right now to to sort of a uh, uh, quarterback from the sidelines, you know. But I, you know, if I was in that position, if there was any chance, I would try to escape every single chance I had. Uh, even if it was a bad decision, even if it was a bad you know, any chance I would had, I would I would, I would go for it. Um, you know, and I think that you know he made a, a stupid mistake. I, th you know, I, b I believe that he he did something stupid, but I do think that he was trying to get off, get out of there, and, and try to get away. You know, I I think that that he wasn't treated very well by the people that was holding him captive. You know, I I think he thought it was going to be a little bit different than how it ended up being. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I I I'm I'm pretty sure that he thought he was going to be welcomed in with open arms. Absolutely. Yeah, and along the lines of what Brendan was just saying in terms of what you're taught during basic training is just what Brendan said he would he would have done was I would and I would have done the same thing at any any point that I felt there was an opening I would have made an attempt to escape uh, again I think that goes back to what I said in the last podcast where people see these things in movies where there's these really calculated plans put together these elaborate escapes and it's just not like that in real life and you're you know fortunately most of us have never been in a situation where you're fighting for your life against captors but I, that's pretty dire so I don't think you feel like oh, I'm gonna wait it out a week or two and try to like figure some things out if you see an opening you're gonna go for it and it's just your survival instincts as a human being kick in I think even more so than a soldier it's just 
being a human being and, and wanting to survive and live, you're going to do whatever it is you think is in your power to do to get yourself out of that situation. Yeah, I, stand, I stand corrected then. <laughs> yeah. Um, so during uh, his second escape, he, he gathered um, tools that would help him make this escape, uh, such as a PVC tube, um, which he made into a crossbar later on. He uh, also found a nail, which he uh, managed to use to get the, the shackles off his wrist. And um, most importantly, may have been the key. The key wasn't um, able to open up the lock for him on, on uh, the cuffs, but he was able to open three padlocks and a chain door over the months uh, that he kept that key. So, I mean, I'll give him credit on that, uh, that he really, he definitely, like you guys said, he was trying to escape and probably, you know, didn't expect how, how it was really going to play out. But when, uh, so when he makes his escape, he leaves, he has the nail, the PVC pipe, and the key, and also an empty liter of Mountain Dew, his hat, a blanket, and sandals. And um, he says he saw his opportunity and went for it. Um, I guess in the middle of the night, he basically put everything together. He had practiced this the few previous nights before, making sure that everyone was asleep, counting down, because he, he didn't know what time it was. You know, he's locked in a room where the light's probably on the whole time, and, you know, it kind of screws you up mentally. So... Um, for him to for him to be able to pull that off was impressive to me. Well, and remind me, did he say where he thought he was going to go if he was able to escape? He, I don't think he said he knew where he was going to go, but he said if he ran into uh, soldiers, that he would strip down naked so they wouldn't shoot him immediately on the spot. I'm not sure. He may have said uh, where he was trying to go, but I, I don't recall it. Okay. I'm sure. I, I was just going to say, Brendan, why, why don't you just talk a little bit, because you were, you, know, you were there. Like Again, you don't just run around the, the mountains of Afghanistan willy-nilly. It's not, it's not that easy, so I don't even know where he thought he was going. No, but I, I don't think that he, he knew where he was at in the first place to know where he was going to go in the second place. You know, That's I, true. I think that so I, I think that what he was trying to do was just get out of there and, and see what he could figure out on the way. I, I would have done the same exact thing. Uh, but, you know, I, I, it, it's all about how he got in the situation. You know, I think he was making really good attempts at getting away, uh, but I think that the, the fact that he got himself in the situation first sort of says all we, we need to know about the fucking guy. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But he was. I think. I think. You know. When. When you come. When you come down to it. I mean. It's not like these. These bases are even marked on the map. You know. Even if I was to. Say if I was in to be in Korangal Valley, I just got plopped down in a Korangal Valley. I had no idea where I was at. It's not like if I could find a map, the 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 bases would be even marked on the map itself. You know where where the the American bases are. So. For him, to, he, he would have just had to go. I mean, that was his best chance is just to get out of there and, and start walking in a direction and hope maybe that if someone bumps into him or he bumps into someone else you know, um, and not get shot in the face while he's doing it. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know what, though? I mean, I guess when you really think about it, you do have a better chance if you can get out and just start wandering. You, I think you have a better chance. In my head, I would, I would maybe think that I would have a better chance if I could just get out and be free try to run into someone versus staying there just because of how barbaric those people are and that their likelihood to just kill him at some point. So I guess when you kind of weigh your options, although it's not the best of options, that was the, the better of the two shitty options. That's well put. Yeah. And also I think about this, I think about this too. Imagine being on the, the opposite end of, of our firepower. Yeah. You know? Like uh, yeah. imagine I mean, okay. imagine what he must have gone through with Bergdahl going through what the Taliban were going through. I mean that that's our firepower. I I would not want to be on the end of one five fives. 
Nope. I would not want to be on the end of an Apache, an A10, I mean, an A10 gun run. Come on. Like, are you serious? Like, no, A count me out. I don't want anything to do with it, you know? A A10s are my favorite planes because they have the Gatling gun, and I just, I don't know, I love that sound. And it's yeah. probably because of the documentaries I watch, everyone's like, woo! Like, they're getting all pumped when they see it. But uh, yeah. I don't know, I love that fucking sound. <laughs> yeah, I mean that, that's what that's what. But I'm saying like it it it'd be most beneficial for him to get out of there as fast as he could because, again, you're on the the opposite end of the the weaponry that we have, and I don't want to be on that end. And we don't know where he is to not you know strategically not take him out in that building. If he's in that building and the U.S. targets it, game over for Bergdahl. You know, game over. Yep. But um. So I watched another documentary a few nights ago, and um, one of his former platoon mates said he heard straight from the interpreter's mouth, um, and I'm going to quote this, within days of his disappearance, teams were monitoring radio chat, cell phone communications, when they intercepted an alarming message. The, the American is in Yayakale, which is a village uh, two miles away from where uh, he was. Or maybe, I'm not sure, maybe it's two miles away from um, where he had originally left from. But um, he says he's looking for someone who speaks English so he can talk to the Taliban. Now that's one of his former platoon mates who said he heard that straight from the interpreter's mouth. And, uh, you know, th these are the things where Sarah makes him out to be this sympathetic figure and then you hear the platoon mates talk, and it's like, what the fuck? You know? Yeah. What? Well, you know, I, th I think, uh, Scotty, I, I, you know, it's, listen, I, I, I'm very proud of my service. Uh, let's, let's just say that. I, I'm very proud of what I did in Afghanistan. I believe in the Afghanistan war. I believe that we, we were there for the right reasons. Um, you know, even away from 9-11, I think that we, we had a job to do from uh, what we gave to them, the Taliban, when they were fighting the Russians. I mean, we had a job to do in Afghanistan. So I'm very proud of my service. But you have to also understand, you know, I used to listen to Irish, a lot of Irish music, a lot of Irish, old Irish songs and stuff like that. I'm Irish, so, it, you know, all the, like, get, go on home, British soldiers, go on home, you know, all these different songs. And then... I would be sitting in bed, laying in bed, or work my, my cot area in Afghanistan, listening to these songs, and then I suddenly realized at some point, oh my God, I'm the British soldier. I'm that guy. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the guy that Irish guy is talking about. I'm the guy that is in someone else's country, and it, and it, it does. It feels terrible. Even if you're in there for the right reasons and you feel like I'm, I'm proud of my service, I, I did the right thing, but I can... I'm not trying to sympathize with him because I think he did wrong, but I can understand where he got disenchanted by. You know, it, it's 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 sometimes it's hard to, hard to be on that end. You know, even though I believe in the war, it did have a, he had. Um, there are things that you have to process. You know, when you're when in that position. Yeah, and maybe at an 18 year old, 19 year old kid. Yeah, and you're just processing. Right? You're not you know obviously you're processing as a soldier, but at the same time too. You're processing at it as a human being, and right. you know I don't think I, I think if you're wired to enjoy or get get something out of killing and harming other people, then there's obviously something wrong with you. I think most of us inherently don't want to hurt other people. That is sometimes just the nature of war, and especially I mean it gets easier if someone's trying to kill you and trying to hurt you. You know you, yeah. you have a less less sympathy for that person but yeah I can I can understand what you're saying Brendan uh, just because I can remember all the faces of these villagers we, you go into these villages and you think about it like this is their home and you know we we can't wrap our brain around that here obviously because we've never been an occupied nation there's no one there's never been soldiers you know obviously not since uh, I don't know the Revolutionary War War of 1812 you know without getting too <laughs> deep into history but um, our society today has never had soldiers from another nation occupying our streets and, and patrolling our streets. So we can't, un people can't understand that. But then when you go into other people's homes and you see their faces and, 
although yes, we were doing good things and we were, our intentions were positive, you still a little party. It feels bad that ugh, I'm disrupting these people's lives. So yeah, yeah it's 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 a tough it's a tough burden to bear, but it's what you sign up for ultimately. Absolutely. Um, as a civilian, you know, I would always just think about. How would we feel if, you know, we were invaded and someone's coming in here and saying all the beliefs, everything you were taught, that's all wrong, do it our way, you know? And, and I, feel, I feel for some of those, I feel for the people that are legit and not causing problems because, you know, you do. You have, you have soldiers come in and they're sticking guns in your face and stuff like that and, you know, that can be disturbing and... You know, I, I feel for I feel for them, and that that's that's why I mean I I, th I only bring this in because you know I, I think that it's it's really easy to look at Bergdahl and say you fucking idiot you know and 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 we all should we all should say that and and what why would you why would you do this but also I I do I I do see the other side of it and I say you know I I can't help but to say. Man, I've been that disenchanted before too. I would never have left my my comrades. Uh, I would never have joined the Taliban or tried to, to talk to them. But I, there has been conversation. You know, I was one time I was going to the bathroom in the middle of the night, and I was at, and I realized suddenly that these these were just twenty year old kids on the other side of the mountain. You know, that were shooting at me every day. That they were, I was a twenty year old kid. They were twenty year old kids, and we were fighting for some big thing that we. Both didn't really understand, and I probably had more in common with those guys across that were shooting at me than I did with my own government. And you know, yeah. and, and when you get to that point inside your head, it's hard not to want to try to reach out and talk to them. You know, it's hard not to to want to say, "Hey, why can't this be a different way? Why can't we just talk about it and figure this out?" Now I don't know what went went on with Birdall or, or what why he did what he did. But if it was anything along those lines, I can almost sympathize with them. But I would never do the same thing, but I could almost sympathize with them. So, so the military settled, uh, the military briefers settled on 8.5 days, which was how long um, Bergdahl was, you know, on his own for. Um, there was one night where he said he saw six drones moving across the sky, and he, I'm going to quote him right here, he says, you're, you're so close, and yet things are so stacked against you that it's just impossible, but you can't do anything but just keep going. Um, my, I don't know how difficult it is to just start a fire on your own. I know I probably couldn't do that, but one of the things I would think of if there's drones above my head, I would be trying to get their attention any way possible without bringing, I guess, the Taliban in there. You know, without attracting their attention or the Haqqani. But that's that's just me. Yeah, but you know, also in, in that that same Seer school, it's a an infantry school. You're, you're taught never, never to have like you know light discipline, light discipline, light discipline. You know, at night we we always are are you know light and noise discipline. You're always being quiet and you're always trying to make sure you're not having any lights. So for him to make a fire in the middle, the middle of the night, and trying to get those attention, I think that would almost go against his training. But yeah, he probably should have done that too. But you know, I, I can see why he didn't because it, it's it, it's ingrained in your head: noise and light discipline, noise and light discipline. Mm -hmm. So, um, like, like uh, we said earlier, he contemplated in his head what uh, he would do if the army convoy came up to him, and he said that he would take off his clothes uh, so he wouldn't think he was a suicide bomber. And uh, shoot at him. Um, on the so uh, I guess that wraps up episode three. Basically, uh, we can move on to uh, episode four here. Um, it begins with uh, Bo. He's already been captured, recaptured by uh, the Hakanis, and um, they throw him in a cage that uh, I guess was not that big. Sarah Canning said she didn't understand what we're doing, um, when, and which, sorry, I'm going to get rid of that, I screwed that up. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, 
she talks to a man named David Rode, who was uh, in a, he's now he's an investigative reporter for Reuters. And uh, back in 2008, he was uh, working with the New York Times and uh, researching a book about Afghanistan. So he arranged an interview uh, with the Taliban commander, uh, which was about an hour's drive south of uh, Kabul. And uh, he got kidnapped at that time. And Sarah brings him in to try to compare how they both were kept while they were captured. Um, he said uh, he was being driven in the car and uh, ran into the Pakistani Army re resupply convoy. And um, he thought that it was a great opportunity to make a run for it. But uh, the guy driving the car ended up being the number two commander of the Haqqani Network. Which um, and his last name was Akani, so probably, probably not the best idea to escape right there. No. But, um, just talking about the Pakistanis and uh, their army reminded me of um, you know, Bin Laden's story, where the Pakistanis, you know, they're not, they, we're not at war with them, but we're, and I don't know if we're, are we allies with them because they definitely hold information back. Um, Bin Laden was just a few miles away from the Pakistani West Point, and uh, you know that just—I don't know—it it popped into my head, and and I—I uh, I don't know. Are we are we allies with Pakistan, or are we just like let them do their own thing? I I think it's one of those situations where. I don't know that you know we're not calling them up if we really need help, but they let us operate in and out of Pakistan um, fairly freely, um, but they're not going to go out of their way to help us. Okay. So it's it's not it, the I guess the best way I could try it, it's an amicable relationship. It's not a, a close relationship. Okay, that's the best way I would describe it. Yeah, no, it's well said. Um, at one of the houses uh, David was held in, he met um, Mullah Sangin, who was in previous episodes in Serial. Um, he's the guy who would later take charge of Bo while he was in custody. And uh, Sangin made an impression on David because he seemed more radical than the other guards. Um, he, was, he was deeply and incredibly uh, like anti-American and um, much more aggressive than the other commanders. And this is coming from David, so you know I take his word for what he said. Um, Sangin, though, got upset with Bergdahl because, and, uh, at one point and, and said, just kill him. He, uh, I don't know what Bo did to him, but uh, Sangin, Sangin uh, was was down to kill him, and um, another person that was connected said, uh, "Don't kill him and sit tight." So, I'm, I'm pretty sure you? that everyone, everyone that was an active fighter, wanted to kill Bergdahl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I don't, I don't think there's too. There, I don't think there was too many of those guys that were like, "Hey, let's keep him alive," you know. All, all the all the low grade guys were like, "Hey, let's smoke him." There, there was one guy, I think, in the, one of the previous episodes where he said Bergdahl was so weak that they kind of left him alone. That was probably a little bit down the line. But, yeah, I get you. I'm sure everyone sees him and is, you know, ready to give him, like, the, <laughs> the cut. But. Oh, yeah, for sure. So, um... This is one of the things that kind of upset me with uh, Sarah. She says in the podcast, if you could set aside the circumstances of Bo's capture, which of course you can't, but if you could, Bo would be a huge success story for the Army. This 23-year-old kid with no training manages not only to survive, but to resist as a POW. The most extraordinary, perhaps he does it alone in isolation. There's no one like this in recent history of the Army with a story like that. And um, my response to that would be there's no one in recent history like that because no one's stupid enough to walk away. It, with American uh, convoys and, and patrols, 
you guys stay in a tight pack. You know, it's not like, Brendan, you're going off on your own over here to go find some bad guys, and Connor, you're going over the other way to find bad guys. Like, you guys stick together. And that's the reason that I would think uh, there hasn't been a lot of captured POW since Vietnam. Am, am I correct on that? Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, Brendan, you go ahead. Because, I mean, um, yeah, just go, go ahead, Brendan. You know, in, uh, inside of um, – when I, my, my, my unit was deployed to Afghanistan, I, I, everyone knows the story of Sal Junta. Sal Junta uh, was the first living Medal of Honor recipient since Vietnam. He was in 1st platoon. I was in 2nd platoon. Uh, he got this, this the medal for uh, running through a, a near side ambush, a near side ambush of about 35 feet, you know, 35 feet from barrel to barrel of these weapons. So there was a, it was a perfect shaped L, L shaped ambush, which is the perfect killing machine for uh, the infantry. Now the the Taliban set up this perfect L shaped ambush. They the Americans walked right into it. Sal earned the Medal of Honor because he ran through that fire, that, that near side ambush, because he thought that his friend was his friend Brennan was up up front, and he knew that Brennan must have got shot. So he ran up through the, the firefight and got to where Brennan was, right? And when Brennan wasn't there, he kept running and found his friend being drug off dragged off by two Taliban. He killed one of them, the Sal killed one of them and shot at the other one, dropped they dropped Brennan. Sal then takes Brennan and pulls him back into the firefight to underneath cover so he so, so Sal can continue fighting for his brothers. Now you hold that, hold that idea, right? You have a guy that ran through a near side ambush. Uh, guns literally from one side of your room to the other side of your room shooting at you. Um to get his friend that was being drug off by by a Taliban, that is that is the opposite of what Bergdahl is. You know, like you know, you don't you you run through near side ambushes to keep everyone together. You do everything in your in your physical ability to keep everyone together because you couldn't imagine being separated. So for him to do what he did goes against everything inside the military. It goes every, against everything that. The military stands for you stay together. It's it's all you have, you know. You run through near side ambushes just to make sure that a guy is okay. Yeah, and I think to build on that, Koenig is using the old "if my aunt had balls, she'd be my uncle" argument. Like if you take away what he did, well, we're not going to because he did it. So that's a stupid freaking comment to make, Sarah Koenig. Quit being an idiot. You can't remove that from the conversation because it happened. So let's not – we don't live in a hypothetical world, all right, lady? We live in a black, you know, a world where, where actions happen. So that was stupid to begin with. And then number two, um, Brennan gives a, a great example, you know, of the story, like kind of like what I was saying um, when I was talking about Bergdahl saying he wanted to be a hero. When people do heroic things like Brendan just described, it's not because they woke up that day and said, I want to be a hero. It's because it's just ingrained in them to look out for their brothers, and then they just act because they're in a crummy situation and they're trained to act heroically. Um, but no one asks to be put in those situations. And then I guess, uh, Scotty, an answer to your question, yeah, we have SOPs, Standard Operating Procedures, Anytime you go outside the wire and you're on, you know, in a convoy or you're on a foot patrol to exactly, you know, what you're saying, no one's just going to, like, run off uh, and, and go off by themselves and, and, and separate themselves from their squad or their platoon because that's when bad things happen. So he's – Bergdahl is a epitome of everything that you shouldn't do and everything, um, you know, against what he was trained to do. Watch Hurt Locker one too many times, right? Yeah, that's what I said. No, that, uh, it's so funny you say that, Brendan. I, I use that as an example. They got these movies out there that are giving people ideas of what things are like, and it's like it's not like that at all. 
it's just the furthest thing from the truth. And you know, don't get me wrong, I love movies, and Hollywood does a great job of keeping people entertained. But they miss the ball so often when it comes to military movies on how, and how we actually operate. Because obviously, you know, if one guy just runs by himself, it makes for a good story and a good movie. But that's how, or that, excuse me, that's not how it would happen. And you know, it's it's like it's almost like going, you know, to say about Sarah, you know, it's like a bank robber going into a bank and robbing the bank, right? Holding people up, getting out away, and then going to give the money to uh, people that need it. Mm -hmm. Like it's an honorable thing to give the money to the people who need it because you did, you know, like that's a great thing. But you can't take away from the fact that what you did in the first place to get the money. It's 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 like a, it's the same thing with Bergdahl. You you know you can you can say he did did the right thing when he got cap, held captive, but you can't take away the fact that what put him in the position to act that way. You know it's like a, you can't separate those two things. They exist together. That's a great comparison, Brendan. And uh, Connor, that that was great too. Um, I, I definitely agree with everything that you guys just said. It, you know, it comes down to some common sense and shit. And um, we're, we'll keep going on. We're almost finished, and uh, then we'll get into um, Restrepo. He, uh, Sarah says uh, she starts talking about um, Guantanamo Bay and prisoners wearing orange jumpsuits and stuff like that. And... Um, she says that the symbolism is so clear and loud, uh, and, but she, until she had heard Bo talk about it, she hadn't realized just how present Guantanamo Bay and other U.S. prisons were for these guys. Obviously, she's not watching the news. Like, you know, even nowadays, there's ISIS with Jihadi John who is executing people in orange jumpsuits and stuff like that. And, I mean, I just don't understand how she... Like, this is new to her. It just, it, it kind of baffles my mind. Obviously, like I said, she probably doesn't watch too much news or something. No, and I think it's also an insult to, to compare our practices, our okay. government, which, by the way, we adhere to the Geneva Conventions. I'm not going to go into depth about the Geneva Conventions. If you care to look that up, go for it. Google that. Mm -hmm. But we adhere to those standards. And these people that were fighting, they, they didn't sign the Geneva Conventions, so they don't give a shit, so they'll treat us however they want to treat us. So I, I think it's really apples and oranges when you compare how we treat our captors to how these guys are, are, are treated. And I just want to know where they're getting all the, the orange jumpsuits from. <laughs> I don't know, maybe eBay. <laughs> Just just track the orange jumpsuits and you'll get the whole terror yeah. network. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, lastly, I just wanted to mention, um, Bergdahl says in the podcast, and he goes, I I'm deployed by American forces when they were asking him, why are you in Afghanistan? And he goes, I'm not a decision maker, and I was deployed. And that goes back to what we were all saying in the first podcast. You know, you, if you're a private first class, Correct. You don't make the decision. So who the hell are you to question people above you? And and it's like so he obviously understands that because he's talking about it. Yeah, I well, mean you know. I, I, go ahead, Connor. No, I was just gonna say, and and you know, Brendan, you you can uh, jump in after I say this and and either agree or disagree with me, but. I said it last time, it's everyone has a certain level of information that is necessary for them to have. You know, me, when I was deployed as a platoon leader, I was briefed by, you know, my uh, troop commander or my battery commander on the information I needed to know that came from battalion. And then I briefed my platoon. And then it's up to my squad leaders to use their discretion and tell their squad what they need to know. And I trusted my NCOs that they were going to inform the rest of the platoon to the extent that they would be able to properly execute our mission for that day. Um, and, our, you know, there's plenty of times, and it happens at every level, unless you're at the very top, unless you're the freaking president with all the information. 
you're going to have questions. There's plenty of times that I had questions, but you just have to accept that. So it's yeah, and I think I, th I think I think you know when it comes down to it is that uh, this is a volunteer army. Yeah. Right. We are in a volunteer army that no one is conscripted to go. Uh, so what the, the what the the thing is is that I, I get a lot of these questions about about joining the military, and I say. To join the military right now in a time of war means that you have to accept the wars that we're fighting. That is the only logical reason to join the military at this moment because the the, the thing that you're going to do is go to war. That is a, a, a that is a definite because that's what we're at. We're at war mm -hmm. with a different you know so so for him to, to to join the military, he knew what he was going to do. He knew that he was going to go overseas. Um, so. For him to join, him saying, I agree with this. This is what I agree with. This is I'm going to support this. So to get to Afghanistan and saying, oh, no, I don't understand. I don't, I don't support it anymore. This, is, this isn't this is what I want to do. Uh, you know, it's it, that's not how it works. You he have to, if, if you're going to join the military. What's that? I said he should have known that going he in. He should have known that going in, like, yeah, you. I mean, you join the military knowing you're going to get deployed. You, we're at war, you know. I don't know where he didn't get the memo um, that that he would be deployed because that's where everyone gets deployed if you're joining the military right now. Yeah, it'd be um, be really interesting, especially when he joined. If you found yourself in a unit or, or doing a certain job where you weren't going to get deployed, there is a very 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 small fraction of the army. There's a few jobs here and there that you wouldn't get deployed. But if you join the army and you are in, in a in an infantry unit, uh, I can't imagine you would think like, ah, oh, maybe maybe uh, our number won't get called or maybe our unit won't get called up. Like, you're you're guys. And as I said, especially at the time he joined, like you're going to Iraq or you're going to Afghanistan based on where you're. You're stationed in what unit you're with. You're going to one of those two places, so you better be prepared for that. And like yeah. you said, he's in the infantry too. Like, what do you think yeah. you're gonna do? Like, you know, build shoes or something? No, you're you're there to fight. So yeah, infantry is the tip of our spear, front lines, fighting the battles. So it's not even like it's uh you know they're they're fobbits, you know guys who don't leave the fobs and don't don't get me wrong. There's plenty of people who don't leave the fobs that. Do very important jobs for us. Yeah. But, um, they certainly carry with them that stigma. Um, hmm. But being in an infantry unit, you need to know that okay, I'm I'm leaving the wire, and I I'm especially Jesus in Afghanistan, or and Iraq for that matter too. You know, you're going to be yeah. engaged with the enemy. So unbelievable thought process for him to get there and then just have a completely different mindset. All right, we're going to wrap up uh, Serial right now and get into uh, a little Restrepo talk. You guys are up for it. I know, um, Connor, just let me know. Uh, yeah, I got uh, a few minutes. Go, ahead. go. We can... No, no, I got, I got right, some time. Go ahead. Cool. Um, we first see Brendan uh, at the very beginning of the documentary Restrepo, and he's actually on the plane. It's like I think it's a week before you guys are about to get deployed. And it's, a, it's actually a train. What is that? It's a train. We're going down to, to Rome. Oh, okay. Oh, all right. I thought it was a plane. All right. That all right. That makes sense. Um, and you have uh, you're sitting next to Doc Restrepo, and I didn't realize that was him. And I had DM'd you, and I was like, dude, this kid next to you is a funny bastard. And you were like, yeah, that's Restrepo, man. Yeah. So I, I didn't know that, but dude, yeah, man, he he definitely was a funny funny motherfucker. Yeah. Um, yeah. He had a good sense of humor. He had a good spirit about him, you know? That's terrific. Um, yeah, first and foremost, if you have yet to see Restrepo and then the sequel, Korngal, stop this podcast right now. Go jump on Netflix and watch that. That's, I think, very important to do. You can um, find Restrepo on YouTube, too. That's what I did. Okay. Connor um, doesn't get uh, royalty checks from that. I, I mean, <laughs> Brendan doesn't get royalty <laughs> checks from that. I don't, I don't get any. <laughs> that, uh, that's kind of like kind of my question, like Brendan, like how did this? Yeah. Because I mean, there's always there's always like um, press and there's always people around when you're deployed, uh, and I guess you don't think much about it. You ask, oh, who's that? But 
how did it all come about that there was going to be a filmmaker entrenched with your unit and wanted to make a documentary? You know, we we um we got out there in uh, May, and when we were over at in in re, when we first got there, we were pushed out to a, a base called OP Phoenix, which later would become a, a OP uh, Vomoto. And uh, OP Phoenix was a shithole. We we got shot at all the time. We were in a bull. Everyone was shooting down us. We were in the low ground. Um, so we which first, which, uh, which which bright ass officer's idea was that to put that there? You know that was the first place to go. You know it was like it was move out from the top, and then uh, t and then you know it was the, it was the next logical step, but it it was a shitty spot, you know for sure. Yeah, is and that true so in had... Is, is What's that, that? true in Because I remember I can't remember which documentary it was, but there was a documentary where um, I watched, and everyone was getting shot at, literally just like you you said, and um, a lot of the guys in the documentary were like, "I'm gonna die here." I don't know if that was Korangal. Um, it might not yeah, have been. It very well might have been. I mean, you know, all combat sort of sort of seems the same, similar, you yeah. know. You're getting shot at, you're getting shot at. But So we had this, uh, you know, we found out that this reporter was coming out. And, you know, you know, with the military, you're trained not to talk to, to, to the journalist. You know, you, you, you give very basic information. You give, uh, you don't go above your pay grade. Pay grade, which which called, you know, you, you talk about what you know. You don't talk about big foreign policy. You don't talk about anything what the officers are doing or anything. So when we first got uh, Sebastian came over there, we didn't really know who he was at first, and uh, it was just you know he was sort of poking around. And when when this happens, when a, a journalist comes in, the the people that talk to him are the probably the most likely the people that no one else talks to. <laughs> <laughs> so they go find the journalist, and it's probably the the person that doesn't give the most accurate description of what your platoon is like, because they're actually not part of that group. Because that that's why they're going to be called to talk to the journalist. It's it's all backwards. But uh, so anyway, we found out that he was a uh, he he was Sebastian Younger, and he wrote the Perfect Storm, and we're like, well, what the fuck is he doing here? He, there's nowhere. There's no water near us. Like you know, go out to the coast, bro. You know, and uh. And so he just he just kept coming back and kept coming back and he kept trying to talk to us and uh, in October we read his first article at a Vanity Fair in 2007 and we realized that the guy just wanted to tell a story you know that he would just we didn't even know at this point that he was going to make a documentary or anything we just knew that he was going to maybe write a book maybe write some journalist uh, journal entries uh, in like Vanity Fair and stuff. And we read the Vanity Fair article, and we realized that this guy is a good dude, and he just wanted to tell our story. That's all he wanted to do was just tell our story. So we, after that, we were like, all right, game on. We talked to him as much as we could because we wanted him to get the real story, not from the guys that were yeah. sort of outcasted from the group. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, obviously it's an award-winning documentary for a reason because I think, I think such a credit to such him. Such a credit I think to him. He did a good job of... You know, obviously being honest, number one, but number two, it it wasn't like he was trying to put any slant on it one way or the other. He was really just like, here it is. This is what it's really like. He wasn't. There was no uh, political agenda. There was no personal agenda on his part to make you guys look bad. It was really just an eye-opening account of what our soldiers were going through on a daily basis. And and for that, I I applauded him. Yeah, yeah let, I, me, let, me just, let me just give real quick credit. Uh, you know, we all we all know that uh, this Restrepo was made by Sebastian Younger and Tim Hetherington, right? But what what's not really given a lot of credit for, and I think it should be given a lot of credit, was there's two editors that helped make this film that made this film really, and it was uh, Michael Levine and Maya Mama, and these two are really the ones that made Restrepo what it was. You know, these two editors. Um, Restrepo uh, couldn't have been Restrepo without those two people. So, you know, I, we I want to just give that shout out because I don't think it's given enough uh, between to to Michael Levine and, and Maya Mama. Sorry, no, sorry, no, get off track. Sorry, absolutely. Um, you know, like you said, uh, and like Connor said, you know, you guys, he, they kept politics out of it, and they let you guys tell the story, and I respect that a lot because there's a lot of people in this world. 
that would slant it one way or another to either make you guys look bad or make someone else look bad or, you know, the political side look bad. And he really called it down the line. Yeah, perfect example. I think freaking Sarah Koenig has a giant slant on breaking – or uh, on Brogdahl on, and telling his story. I think there's a giant slant there, and it's not – it's it's positive for her, but I, I think it's – um. You know, trying to paint him in a certain light that is not necessarily the most accurate one. Well, you know, it, what the thing is about uh, Sebastian and Tim is that they they made Restrepo from their own pockets. They wouldn't sell it to anyone because they didn't want to have a slant on it. That's the only reason Restrepo is the movie that it is because they paid for it out of their own pockets. They went broke making this film because they wanted to make sure that the, the film got its you know the right the right they write message across. And I bet you if you talk to Sarah, someone's giving her the money to make this book or whatever she's making. So so there's a slant on it because of that. There's you know, she has obviously a, a, a agenda. Uh, yep. you know, when you have when you talked about Sebastian and that's why what makes Sebastian Younger so much different than almost all journalists out there is that he doesn't put the slant on it he, because he works he just tries to be as bi unbiased as possible and write the what what's actually happening I mean I, I don't think that you have many journalists out there that are actually doing that or can do that monetarily exactly because you know? guess what what it happens and I, I've been privy to talk to some journalists and um, you know they can report whatever they want to report but then they have to send it back to the editor back in the states and then the editors have to go through and say okay what's gonna get the most page views what's gonna get the ratings on the news tonight and they pick and they cherry pick these stories and they also will say go back and rewrite this and write it a different way so that's why I think it's so important when people hear this these podcasts and they watch the news that they take it with a grain of salt because there's always a little bit of an agenda going on there. So I think, yeah, that's why, like you said, Restrepo is so great. And Jesus, credit to, to those guys because uh, I think I, you can, you know, tell me from, remind me, um, I feel, did you guys give them a weapon? No, you guys oh. were covering them. Uh, when that IED went off at the very beginning, of uh, the movie, he got out. Remember the camera volume like went off or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, up. okay. Yeah, and no, I know. Like, it's not. It's not common practice. To, I shouldn't. I should rephrase that. It's not common practice to give journalists weapons. But I, I thought I remembered at one point like somebody was injured and they picked up a weapon or something. Probably not. But the fact that you just decide, all right, I'm gonna jump in with this unit that is under heavy fire day after day. That takes some serious balls. Definitely, and um, it takes no, even more no. balls to be like you, Brendan, and the uh, people that were covering him when you guys are getting shot at. You guys are willing to take a bullet and you know risk your life to save him, and you know that's what I really respect. But you, but you got to understand also these. When we were in Afghanistan, we thought we were getting shot at a lot, and we sh we thought we saw a lot of combat. Which we, for an uh, American infantry unit inside of Afghanistan, sure, we were getting shot at a lot, right? But one time we asked Tim and, and Sebastian, you know, like cockily, you know, like sort of cocky, like, "Hey, I bet you never seen no shit like this before," you know? And they both sort of looked at us and they looked at each other a little bit, you know, and they tr they were trying to be polite, and they're like, "Listen, we've seen a lot of stuff." You know, Tim Hetherington was in Mogadishu, oh, uh, in, in, Somal in Somalia. He was the he was the only one and uh, only white guy in Monrovia for like five years. He lived there. He fucking lived there for like five or six years in Monrovia. A six foot three white guy. You know, uh, th these guys saw more stuff than uh, you know. Sebastian had been covering war since Kosovo. Um, these guys have seen some serious combat. They knew exactly what to do in combat. So you can give us credit, but they really were combat. I mean, they were much. They were very proficient in what they knew. They knew what they had to do to stay out of the way of bullets, um, and they knew how to stay out of the way of us too. That's impressive. And so they, yeah, That's they fell in line. They they made sure that they learned the, the way to do it, and they knew where to go when we were getting shot at. And they were they were they were part of the platoon. Uh, they never caused us any problems. Zero problems at all. 
uh, never asked us to carry their gear, never asked us to do anything besides just tell us the truth. Nice. Uh, tell them the truth. That's, that's extremely refreshing to hear. Not that I'm surprised, but that is very refreshing to hear. Yeah. So, so Brendan, you were in the Korengal from May of 2007 until August of 2008. Uh, that's, that's a 15-month deployment. That is a long time to be in Afghanistan. Um, at the end of the documentary, it says when the U.S. pulled out of the Korengal two years later in uh, 2010, that 50 soldiers had lost their lives fighting there. I just want to give the viewers a perspective on how bad it was and you know how dangerous it was. Uh, in the documentary, the the combat outpost was uh, eventually named after Doc Restrepo after he was KIA'd um, early on in the deployment. Uh, how did that come about? How did you guys decide to uh, name the combat outpost after him? You know, I think it's it's pretty common uh, practice. Um, you know, I, I know that it came down the line. A lot of guys were, up, you know, pretty up against it at first, you know, because it... You know, when we first set up OP Restrepo, that was a, I mean, it was a bad place. You know, we were getting shot. We didn't have any overhead cover. We didn't have anything. We had, we were getting shot at a lot, man. Well, the first day that we were setting up the base, we got shot at, I think it was like 15 firefights in the first two days. I um, mean, it was just constant combat. And uh, so I remember the, 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 coming down the line like, hey, I, I hear that OP, this is going to be named OP Restrepo, and a lot of guys were pretty up against it, you know, they were they were pretty up against it. And then after a while, you know, it started becoming home, and uh, I don't really remember when or how it became OP Restrepo, I just remember that it, it started becoming OP Restrepo. And then, you know, we, we built it into our, our home. I mean, it, we loved that place. It was hard to leave. <laughs> it's funny, Yo, you know, it's a, a, Scotty, it's so funny, like, you you build something up from nothing, and it's it's like in the beginning it's so shitty, and then you kind of like mold it and you make it comfortable and you make it your own, and don't get me wrong, like it's it's a great feeling when you're leaving to go home for a deployment, but it's almost like yeah you're like leaving your home behind, yeah. all this work that you did and you made it a, a livable situation and a, as comfortable as possible. Um, so yeah, it is a little weird in that regard. Yeah. yeah. Um, another moment in the documentary that caught my eye was um, when you guys ca you guys came up on uh, the Taliban and a member was running away, and then there was a village elder who had the reddest beard I've ever seen in my life. But um, you you come out uh, with a Taliban camo jacket in the house and you're holding it up and. Um, <laughs> Hold on, I just lost my spot. And uh, oh, and during that during that encounter, um, I thought it was very smart by you. When there's a language barrier, you used your hands a lot to speak. You were like sit down, and um, you would do things like that. And I actually I like that because it, I would I felt like I would do the same thing if I was in that situation where you can't really communicate with someone. You use basically made up sign language. <laughs> for lack of a better term, I, you know, he was a, he was obviously a village elder. Uh, in, in that situation, normally, you, you know, you put your hands on the guy and you actually physically put him down on the ground. Uh, we were searching his house. He was being he wasn't listening. He was he was standing. I disrespect him either. Um, he, he he was an older older person. So I was just trying to tell him to sit down without touching him because normally in that situation I would have had him on the ground probably probably hit with uh, the um, zip zip ties and everything like that and that would have been protocol but he was an older man I just you know I, fi I figured it would be the best but I always love that scene where I try, I try to get information I say uh, who who does this belong? and then I'm like oh, never yeah, mind, oh, never mind. <laughs> that, that was hilarious <laughs> um, and, and then you, uh, you also, you, you were like, you pointed to your eyes and you told the Taliban, or not the Taliban, um, the Afghani army that was with you, you know, you go check this. And, you know, it's yeah. just things like that where people don't realize, you know, you guys are with an Afghani army at times and it, that's another language barrier. They're fighting with you 
well, at least you hope they're fighting really with you. And <laughs> now I've heard a few yeah. stories, but um, yeah, you One know, it's, it's, yeah, it's just uh, you know, the fact that you can't communicate, and uh, I really thought that you were smart to do it the way that you did. So I'll give you props. Yeah, for that. thanks, man. I think that uh, you know the. The the thing that I also have to point out is is that I I wasn't the one that got the BDU jacket out of the building. We weren't uh, our our r rules of our rules of engagement were that we couldn't actually search the buildings ourselves. The okay. Afghan national, unless we were getting shot at directly from that building, then we could go in there and clear it and stuff. But um, the Afghan national army found that inside there. So you know you got to give them credit because they that they're they're the ones that did this and they found it and stuff like that. So. They were doing their jobs out there. They're trying to do their. They're trying to do their best. Yeah, that's they were cool. garbage though. Um, in the documentary, um, a few of your soldier, fellow soldiers um, point out that Rock Avalanche was one of the lowest points during your deployment. Um, I don't know how much you want to get into Rock Avalanche, but can you give us a little um, quick background or synopsis on um, what happened there? You know the the truth the truth is is I was uh when Rock Avalanche was going on my sister had fallen asleep while cooking, and and uh, a fire started on her on her stove and she she almost died she was in a coma she was um burnt her lungs almost completely, so I had to be I had to go home for for Rock Avalanche to see I I got home and she was in a coma in the bed, in a hospital bed so. Uh, you know, I heard of all the things that were going on in Afghanistan during Rock Avalanche, of my three friends passing away, of all the, the things that were going on through the internet, of all places. Wow. You know, and yeah. uh, and then and watching my sister sit in a coma, not knowing if she's going to wake up out of it. It was it was um, it was unbelievable. That, that that was the most helpless I've ever felt in my life, man. Uh, so I don't know exact. I can't speak about Rock Avalanche. I only know about it through second hand. And um, but what my experience was a lot different than theirs, yeah. That's heartbreaking, and it's also it's got to light a fire under your ass when you're back in the states, and then you hear that you know your boys, you know, have been killed and stuff. But um, damn man, um, how, is she doing better now? Yeah, I mean she's uh she's she's got really bad lung. I mean she needs a lung transplant sooner or later. Uh, she only has about thirty percent lung capacity. She she. She barely made it alive. Uh, uh, they didn't give her much of a of a chance, and she she beat the odds. So she's all right, but she's still you know there's definite problems from it. Yeah. Um. Geez, it's got to run in your DNA, being tough bastards. Then. But, um, That's what the my great my great grandmother just passed away uh, today, 105 years old. Uh, so we got some we got some longevity in this life in, in this in this family. I don't know. Wow, so, I'm sorry for your loss, but um, yeah, I'm very sorry wow. to hear that, man. That, yeah, so, that's a long life. I, you know, I'm sure she enjoyed her life. So. Yeah, that's insane. Um, yeah, towards the end of the documentary, uh, just one of the last points I wanted to point out, and then you guys can talk about anything you want, but we can wrap it up really soon. So, um, one of your sister companies, chosen company. They lost nine soldiers starting a new OP, as well as 12 U.S. wounded and 13 Afghani army members wounded. Um, were you were you back for that? Yeah, I was. I was. Uh, I was. You know, we were at the co the Korn I remember the getting the news. It was. I was at the Korangal outpost when that happened, and uh, you know. Chosen Company was a good company. They're good. They had good leaders. They had all this. Um, but what what they didn't have was they didn't have constant combat. The constant combat inside the Korangal kept us always attentive. You know, like we always knew what we had to do. We were never complacent. We, you know, the constant combat never let us allowed it, allowed us to be complacent. Mm -hmm. What happened with the Chosen Company is that they would get into some serious heavy firefights and then nothing for a long time, and then serious heavy firefights. So they had like two or three uh, really significant firefights inside the uh, inside of that deployment that killed one killed six people, the other one killed nine people. Uh, the 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 one the one patrol that killed six people they had a 100% casualty rate which hasn't happened since Vietnam, you know. Um, so it, I mean they they just had these these 
very intense firefights very infrequently. And I think that that led to the, the high numbers of deaths and stuff like that. Yeah, that's but it was bad. it was really tragic to hear that. You know, uh, we heard we heard some serious, you know, a lot, some of the guys that we that were in the Korangal with us uh, died in that firefight. You know, friends of ours died in that firefight. So it was it was really hard to hear about that stuff. You know, and and the worst thing about the infantry, the worst thing that the worst feeling that you can get in the infantry is not being able to do anything. You know, hear your buddies getting shot at over here. And not being able to do anything, just getting the news and saying, "Okay, deal with this." You know, your friends are dying over there. What, what are you going to do about it? You can't do anything. You know, and that—that's a—that's a helpless feeling for infantry. Yeah, and and um, I don't know who it was, but a higher up in your platoon, um, you know, they had it on film when he was talking about it, and he was like, "Mourn for them right now, and then get back to business, basically." And um, yeah. You know, like that's what you have to do when you're at war, and um, you know, I just I give you guys a lot of props for, for uh, you know being able to go through all that, and um, yeah, and just uh, I think it speaks to the, um, uh, you know, the the leadership you guys had at the top, and then as I had mentioned uh, in the previous podcast, the the backbone of the army as a whole, but of any good unit is strong NCOs. So I think if you have strong NCOs, you get through anything. So it it really um. It really came through in the film that the the leadership was there, and then the continuity of your brotherhood was there to. I don't. I, I would never say soften the blow, but aid in you guys being able to continue on with your mission when bad things were happening, when morale was somewhat low, um, because that's. That, that I think that's the trickiest thing about deployment is just to, to maintain the morale, uh, yeah. and figuring out ways to, to keep people from getting depressed, and because then you know if people are depressed and upset and their mind is wandering, then their mind is not focused, and then that's when people could potentially get hurt, and you don't want that. So um, again, just a, a credit to Brendan to your unit and to the NCOs and your soldiers in your unit. I think you guys really displayed the intestinal fortitude that we hold so dearly in the army and, and try to impress upon every soldier and how important that is. Uh, you guys really displayed that in grand fashion. Uh, thanks, man. You know, I think, I think uh, you know, uh, have you guys ever heard of The Endurance, um, the, 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 the book The Endurance? It's called it's Ernest Shackleton. Um, okay, well, Ernest... Ernest, Ernest Shackleton was a explorer in the early 1900s, right? And um, him and his, his boat, they went to go see the South Pole. They wanted to be the first ones at the South Pole, right? So what this whole story is, is they got stuck on this ice for about two years. And and now these guys had nothing. They had nothing except for what there was on their boat, but the boat got crushed, so they didn't have anything except for each other. Very similar to a combat deployment, Except for they weren't getting shot at, they were just dealing with like the ice and snow. <laughs> and uh, so the what Shackleton did was that he was the captain of the ship. He what he made sure his men did was every single night and every single day he gave them something to do. He made sure that they had something to do every single day, even if it was pointless. Was just to go and do something, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, like at night they they would do these stupid plays that they put together and 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 it would. You know, they would dress up and do these different things. And all those things combined, you know, keeping busy and stuff like that, that's the success on a deployment. Because as yeah. soon as you let your guys just sit around doing nothing, then they start playing, their, their minds start playing games with them. And you, you can't let their mind play games on you, you know. So what we would do out at Restrepo is that we just build all the time. We'd fill sandbags. We would do something. If if we were if we weren't building something useful, we were building Hesco Joes, you know, these like plywood cutouts to see how many times they get shot in a firefight, you know, <laughs> like something. Always building something or or doing something funny, you know. And I think that that, that really what is what led to our success out there was was that ability to stay busy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I I guess we can wrap it up unless uh, you guys have anything else you want to add. No, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, I don't know about you, Brendan, but I mean, I, I think you and I could go back and forth and trade stories for a long time, and 
uh, you know, I'm sure everyone's got stuff to do. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Hey, but, I'm, yeah. I'm tell stories. It'll increase my podcast rating. Well, you know, I'd be happy. <laughs> we can do. We can do a whole another episode if we just want to trade stories. Oh no, cool. man. Hey, that that's that. I'm game for that. I can tell stories all day long. Yep. It's, the, okay. it's my my favorite and worst memories of life. You know, I, <laughs> I heard this this one guy say. Uh, he said, I I I wouldn't for his experiences in the military. He said, I won't sell it for a million dollars, but I wouldn't pay five cents for it either. And I think that's that, that is it. There's the military right there for you. You know. Yeah, that's wouldn't that's, sell it for a that's dollars, that's but wouldn't pay five cents for it either. Yeah. That is perfect. That's yeah. awesome. So uh, yeah, Brennan. Uh, hopefully we can get you back on the podcast and uh, for some more episodes, you know, down the line. We'd love to have you back yeah, on. Uh, Connor, thank you for always joining us. Um, Absolutely. You can find Connor at Captain Cons on Twitter, and uh, you know, ask him any questions. Feel free to ask me questions at Depot 12s, and uh, you can find Brendan at O'Burn Brendan. And um, I'm telling you guys, if you haven't seen Restrepo, I highly suggest it. it is, if you want to know what war is like and what American soldiers go through, watch that movie. That's all I can say about that. And uh, I'm, I'm going to give, give a quick, I'm gonna give a quick shout out to uh, to uh, the Last Patrol. Also, if you haven't seen, so it goes from Restrepo, Corangal, and then the Last Patrol was the last film that uh, mm -hmm. me and Sebastian. Uh, that, awesome. That's a good film, too, about coming home and about why it's so hard to come home. Awesome. Now i got a couple more documentaries on my uh, on my hit list now. So that's awesome. Yeah. All right, guys. Um, so, yeah, I think we're going to wrap it up here. Uh, that's it for Undrafted's Breaking Bergdahl uh, podcast, episode three and four review of Serial Season 2. And uh, we'll be back soon, guys, uh, for episode five, and um, we'll keep going. So, uh until the next time, everyone, have a nice night. See ya. All right. Thanks, fellas. Anytime, Thanks. guys. Later. See ya.